Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day today. If you're new here, welcome. Please make sure to subscribe. We talk about true crime cases here on this channel, usually on Mondays. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a solved case, or it's practically solved at this point. It's the case of Pamela Harp, and you might have actually heard of this one because I think just last year, a TV show came out about it called The Thing About Pam, and I completely understand why they made a TV show about this case because it is completely insane like probably one of the most insane cases I've ever looked into so strap in because it is a wild ride. So Pamela Hupp was born Pamela Marie Newman on the 10th of October in 1958 in Delwood, Missouri. She was born to her father who was named Victor who was a blue collar worker at Union Electric and her mother Shirley who was a school teacher and Pamela was one of four children so she had two brothers Michael and Dan and a sister named Sherry. They were raised in a regular suburban Missouri neighborhood and she had a pretty normal childhood. She went to Riverview Gardens High School and you know she liked to hang out and ride bikes around with her friends who called her Pam. Everyone in her life just knew her as Pam. As she got older she got into cheerleading so she was a pretty popular gal. She was known by her friends to be pretty easygoing. She had a good sense of humor and she was always laughing and she was also very boy crazy enough so that it distracted her from her studies. In fact, in high school, she became infatuated with this guy named Louis, who was on the soccer team. They were high school sweethearts. And by the end of her senior year, she was pregnant and they had a shotgun wedding, which her parents did not love because they were pretty conservative. But at that point, like there really wasn't much that they could do about it. Pam was also very headstrong and her mind was made up that, you know, while all her friends were going off to college and continuing their studies, she wanted to stay at home and raise a family and be with Louis and you know wanted to live a more domesticated life. Eventually she gave birth to their daughter who they named Sarah but eventually after six years of marriage her and Louis relationship ended and they got a divorce but Pam was right back on the horse. She did not waste a minute. Pretty shortly after her divorce from Louis she met a man named Mark Hupp and he was a minor league baseball player. He played for the Texas Rangers and they had like a whirlwind romance. They got married and it was all just really quick. And then together they moved to a place called Naples, which is in Florida. And it was there that they welcomed a son into the world named Travis in 1989. And Pam was also still looking after her daughter, Sarah, from her first marriage. So her and Mark now had two children. Unfortunately for Mark, he didn't make it into the Major League Baseball. And so he moved on, found work as a carpenter and Pam worked at various jobs in the life insurance industry. By 2001 they decided to move back to Missouri to a place called O'Fallon and here Pam got a job at State Farm and she and Mark were also flipping houses on the side for extra cash. And then by 2010 Pam stopped working and she started claiming disability for back, leg and neck pain that she was experiencing but she still kept up a very vibrant social life. She'd become friends with this one woman in particular named Elizabeth Faria who was also also known as Betsy. She was born on the 24th of March in 1969. So she was about 10 years younger than Pam, but they got along really well. Betsy had two daughters in a previous marriage before meeting her husband, Russell Faria, who she married in 2000. And she lived with her family of four in Troy, Missouri, which is about an hour drive from her work at State Farm, which is where she met Pam back in 2001. They were both working there and they were pretty different. Betsy was this really warm, welcoming woman. She was also described as a party starter. Her husband Russ said, quote, if she went to a party or gathering or get together, she'd get everybody out playing games or get people up dancing. That was her personality. She always had to be on the go. He also said, I guess that's kind of what drew me to her and the others as well. She had that kind of style about her, that kind of personality where she'd never met a stranger. Russ also said that Betsy had a lot of hobbies. She loved being outdoors. She loved camping or playing tennis or 
volleyball and Pam by this point was a lot more serious but they still had a lot in common they still had young families and they became friends so by 2010 they'd known each other for about 10 years they did fall out of touch for most of that time but in 2010 Betsy was diagnosed with breast cancer and I guess this brought the two of them closer and Pam was you know helping her out driving her to and from chemo appointments that sort of thing unfortunately by October of 2011 things were getting a lot worse for Betsy she was declared terminal and told she had three to five years to live as the cancer had spread to her liver and after receiving this news in November of 2011 she and her husband Russ went on a celebration of life cruise where they swam with the dolphins which was on Betsy's bucket list it was a dream of hers back in Missouri Betsy was really starting to lean more and more on Pam because Pam was honestly such a huge help to Betsy through everything that she was going through not just her cancer but also because Betsy was really stressed out she was stressed out about you know what was going to happen to her daughters and her husband when she passed and particularly about her daughter's financial well-being she had a big life insurance policy and she was just worried that they wouldn't know how to deal with the money once she passed and that Russ wouldn't know how to deal with the money properly and that Russ would maybe spend the money and it just wouldn't be used properly on her daughters like her daughters wouldn't get the full advantage of the money that was left to them and so Pam told her you know don't worry about it I can put all of the money all of your life insurance money into a trust for your daughters and I can make sure that they get all of it and that it's spent on them in the right way and they can take full advantage of this money. And you know, that way you don't have to stress, I can take care of it and you can just enjoy the rest of your time with your daughters. So on the 22nd of December, Betsy actually changed the sole beneficiary of her life insurance, which was $150,000 life insurance policy. And she changed that from her husband Russ over to Pam Hupp, which her husband Russ wasn't even aware of. Like he was under the the impression that he was still set to inherit a bunch of money. Five days later on the 27th of December, so just two days after Christmas, it was just, you know, a regular day. Russ went to work and then he went and saw some friends afterwards. It was a Tuesday night and he and his friends always had a Tuesday game night. And this particular night they were at his friend Michael's house and there was five people in attendance, including Michael and Russ. Russ and Betsy had also been texting all day about just, you know, regular things that they would text about on a daily basis, picking up dog food. Betsy had a chemotherapy appointment that day and she was there with a family friend named Bobby. And then after her chemo session was done, she was going to go to her mum's house in St. Louis and Russ was going to pick her up from there on his way home from game night. So they were just, you know, texting about that sort of thing. And then while Betsy is at her chemo appointment with Bobby, all of a sudden Pam just unannounced randomly shows up. Betsy and Bobby were both really surprised because they weren't expecting Pam, but it wasn't like too insane because like I said, Pam was really involved with helping Betsy out with her cancer, picking her up from chemo and taking her home from chemo. And she was just really supportive of all of Betsy's cancer treatments. She was with her through everything. You know, it wasn't that strange and Pam really wasn't there for that long. She ended up leaving, going home, having dinner with her husband. And while she was having dinner with her husband, Betsy went to her mum's house to wait for Russ to come and pick her up after he finished at his game night. While she's there waiting for him, Pam comes and shows up at her mum's house unexpectedly as well. I guess she had mentioned when Pam was at the chemo session earlier that she was going to her mum's house in general conversation. And then Pam just like shows up at her mum's house and she's like you know I'm happy to drive you back to your house like her mum's house is in St. Louis and Betsy and Russ's place was in Troy and she's like I'm happy to drive you home and Betsy was like, sure. She sends Russ a text saying, Pam Hupp wants to bring me home. She offered and I accepted. Russ ended up leaving his game night at 9 p.m. that night and he had a 25 mile drive home from game night to their house in Troy. And he stopped at Arby's on his way home to, you know, get some dinner. He also tried calling Betsy on his way home, but she didn't answer, which, you know, wasn't really concerning because when they had been texting earlier that day, she had said that she was super exhausted 
from her chemo sessions. So he just assumed she was like sleeping or something. But then when he got home at around 9.40 p.m. or just before 9.40 p.m., he calls out Betsy's name. She doesn't say anything. He walks into the house, into the living room, and her body is there lying in front of their couch in a pool of blood. She has severe stab wounds. She has deep gashes on her wrists and she has a knife still sticking out of her neck. Russ immediately calls the police. He calls 911 at 9.40 p.m. and he tells them my wife has slashed her wrists. She has tried to kill herself because that was his initial reaction. He was in shock and that was the immediate conclusion that he jumped to because of the scene when he arrived home. You know, there were deep gashes on her wrists. There was a knife still protruding from her neck and Beth Betsy had also previously struggled with suicidal thoughts. She was really struggling with her terminal cancer diagnosis to the point where she had tried to previously end her own life and had been hospitalized for doing so. Russ explained all of this to the 911 dispatcher in their 10 minute call. And so police were immediately sent out to the scene, to their house. Deputy Christopher Hollingsworth was the first officer on the scene. He actually arrived while Russ was still on the phone and he said, that as soon as he saw Betsy, he knew that this was not a suicide. She had been stabbed over 55 times, including in the eye. Her wrists had been sliced to the bone. She still had the serrated knife in her neck. And then another knife was found underneath a pillow on the couch that she was found lying in front of. There were initially some conflicting reports about when she was actually murdered. Some first responders believed that she could have been dead for two hours while other first responders believed that it could have been as little as 30 minutes. So the investigation got underway right away. Russ was taken to the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office at around 11 p.m. and he was pretty intensively interrogated over the next 10 and a half hours but his story was consistent the entire time. He had no blood on his clothes. Literally none of Betsy's DNA was found on him at all but investigators were immediately suspicious of him because you know in his 911 call he claimed Betsy had killed herself when she clearly had not. This was clearly a murder. First responders actually said it was ludicrous that he tried to describe it as a suicide because, you know, the amount of injuries she had and just, you know, the way that the scene looked, it was really, really brutal. And there was no way that she had done that to herself. And then there was also the fact that he had been taken off the life insurance policy just five days earlier, which is obviously a pretty big motive. So it was not looking good for Russ. So while he was being interrogated, investigators were out verifying his alibi and they went and questioned his four friends that he had been with at game night that night. And they all said the same thing, that he was there with them until 9 p.m. They also searched and swabbed his car and no blood was found in his car. They got a search warrant for Russ and Betsy's house and they found no signs of a cleanup, no bloody towels, no bloody footprints or anything like that. But they did find a little bit of blood on a light switch which play and they also found blood on a pair of Russ's slippers which were found in the bedroom closet. They also found a weird dark mark on Betsy's leg which resembled a paw print and the Farias did have a dog which was chained up outside when authorities arrived after Russ you know first called 911 and so it was theorized that you know, whoever had murdered Betsy had after the murder gone and chained the dog up outside. And this dog was not friendly to people. So it was theorized that whoever murdered Betsy had to have been well known to the family and to the dog. The day after the murder on the 28th of December at 2 p.m., Russ underwent a polygraph test, which he actually failed. And so despite four people confirming his alibi, he was placed under arrest for the murder of his wife. And he was placed in custody as the investigator investigation continued. The next step investigators took was looking into Betsy's phone records. They found that at 7 p.m. on the night of her murder, she had called a friend named Laurel to cancel a tennis session that they had booked. They also saw some calls on there from her daughter, Leah, and they went and spoke to Leah. And she said that on the night of the murder, she had gone out to upgrade her phone. And she called Betsy and said that she would need to speak to a representative over the phone in order to authorize 
the upgrade and Betsy said, no worries, I'll be here when you need me. So Leah tried to call her again at 7.21 and Betsy didn't answer. She tried twice more at 7.26 p.m. and 7.31 p.m. but she was never able to get a hold of her mum. The last recorded time that anybody ever heard from Betsy was at 7.04 p.m. Pam tried to call her husband Mark and he didn't answer so she left a voicemail and Betsy can be heard in the background of this call which was at 7.04 p.m. Russ didn't get home until 9.40 p.m. so that leaves a two hour and 40 minute window in which Betsy could have been murdered. Her autopsy also revealed that when her body was discovered she had been dead for between two and four hours which would mean that Russ couldn't have been responsible. However the doctor that performed the autopsy said that there was this like controversial medical theory where a body can exhibit signs of advanced rigor mortis immediately after being murdered which would basically throw the entire timeline off and would mean technically that she could have been murdered right before Russ called the police. Now because Pam was the last person to see Betsy alive they went and spoke to her got her fingerprints DNA all of that sort of thing. They also questioned her about Betsy and the night of the murder. She said that she dropped Betsy off at her and Russ's house at around 7 p.m. She also claimed that Russ had a violent temper that he was a heavy drinker and that he had threatened Betsy before because Betsy had considered leaving him and in fact she was planning to tell Russ that she was leaving him the night of the murder. She also told police that they should go and check Betsy's computer because there would be a file on there, a letter that Betsy had written basically detailing how scared she was of Russ. She claims that she hadn't actually seen the letter herself but she was able to detail, I guess like Betsy had told her about it or something because she was able to detail the contents of the letter pretty well and sure enough police went and checked Betsy's computer and they found a file on there it was a, a letter written on Microsoft Word about how terrified Betsy was of her husband so for police this was a pretty clear-cut case Russ had murdered his wife in a fit of rage and they ignored a lot of information to get to this conclusion. They ignored the fact that four of Russ's friends swore that he was with them that night. They also overlooked a lot of inconsistencies in Pam's story. For example, the document that they found on Betsy's computer about how scared she was of Russ, that, like I said, was written on a Microsoft Word document, but Betsy didn't even have Microsoft Word downloaded on her computer. And it was also the only file on her computer which was written by an unknown author. Like I said Pam was also able to detail the contents of this letter pretty well but she claimed that she had never actually seen it herself. So how did she even know what was in this letter? Why would Betsy write a letter and then like read it to her but not show it to her? Like why would she be like I wrote this letter about Russ let me read it to you and then not show her the letter. Like it's just a bizarre situation. She also initially said that when she dropped Betsy off at home at 7 p.m. that she didn't enter the Faria's household but then in a later interview she said that she did and in fact she went as far as to go into Betsy's bedroom and then there were also phone records that showed that she was in the Faria's house for 30 minutes which is a a far cry from her originally saying that she had never been in their house that night that she just dropped her off and left. She also said in one interview about the last time she saw Betsy, quote, she may still have been on the couch, but today it makes sense that she walked me to the door. She also told investigators that her and Betsy were really close friends, that they saw each other almost every day, but she also said that she still didn't know how to get to and from Betsy's house. And then probably the biggest thing that was overlooked about Pam was the fact that she was named the sole beneficiary of Betsy's $150,000 life insurance just five days before Betsy was murdered. If that is not a motive, I don't know what is, but I think investigators were just so focused on Russ at this point and focused on the fact that he was taken off the life insurance so he must have been pissed about that, that they didn't even think it was weird that Pam was put on the life insurance, the sole beneficiary of the life insurance. They did ask her about it and she just said like, oh, you know, I don't think Betsy trusted Russ or her daughters to be responsible with the money and I told her I would put it in a trust for her daughters and that was good enough for investigators. They 
you know, didn't even question Pim at this point. They didn't, she wasn't even on their radar as a suspect at this point. For them, it was just Russ. And after holding him for nearly 24 hours, police requested an arrest warrant and formal charge against him, but this was denied and he had to be released. But then on the 4th of January in 2012, they were able to formally arrest and charge him with first degree murder and armed criminal action. His bail was set at $250,000, which he was unable to pay. And so he was held in the county jail until his trial began on the 18th of November, the following year. So that's 20 two months that he had to sit in jail awaiting his trial. When his trial began, his defense really relied on the testimony from his four friends that said that he was with them that night at the time of the murder. It also relied on cell phone records and on CCTV footage. There was CCTV footage of him going through the Arby's drive through on the night of the murder. There was also an Arby's receipt found in his car from the night of the murder. His cell phone also showed that he was 20 miles or around 32 kilometers away from him and Betsy's house at the time that the murder likely took place. There was also no evidence of any blood being in his car, on his body, or on his clothes. There was the blood on his slippers that were found in his bedroom closet, but the defense argued that this was somebody basically trying to frame him or to make it look like he committed the murder, to deflect blame of who the real killer was. Why were there no bloody towels? Why was there no sign of a cleanup? Why was there no blood found on his actual body, just his slippers? It does not make sense if he murdered Betsy, for there to only be blood on these slippers and these slippers only, nowhere else. And not to mention that these slippers, the blood on these slippers is the only piece of physical evidence that they have against Russ. And prosecutors tried to say, oh, well, you know, maybe he killed her naked and then like had a shower, which I mean, doesn't even make sense. But also there was no evidence of blood in the shower or in the drain of the shower or anything. All other evidence they had against him was like circumstantial assumptions at best. It was like, oh, he got taken off the life insurance policy. So he was probably pissed about that. His wife may have been scared of him because this one single chick said so. And he said that it was a suicide on the 911 call, which is weird. So, you know, he obviously killed her. Literally all of it is just circumstantial assumptions. But what's even more insane, right? This gets more insane, okay? The prosecution's argument against Russ is honestly wild. Like I cannot even believe that they thought, like this is an educated person, right? This is a lawyer who went through law school, who went through high school. I feel like even going through high school, okay? I feel like even if you didn't go to school, anyone is smart enough to not think that this is like a logical explanation. But the prosecution tried to argue that Russ's four friends that gave him the alibi and said that he was with them that night, that they actually, because they gave him this alibi, they must have all been conspiring to murder Russ's wife with him. And so they held his phone so that when he was at home murdering his wife, his phone would show that he was actually with them. They also tried to say that one of these friends must have driven Russ's car through the Arby's drive through to get food so that his car would be seen on CCTV, not at the murder scene while Russ was murdering his wife, right? So providing him with a fake alibi, which is just so insane. It's so outlandish because what do these four guys have to gain from Russ murdering his wife? What are they gonna get out of that? And four of them too. This isn't just one guy allegedly helping him out. This is four guys who all have consistent stories. Not one of them has cracked and not one of them has a reason to want to help him murder his wife. The prosecution also played the tape of Russ's 911 call and they claimed that his demeanor was fake because he like went in and out of hysteria. So I really think they were just grasping at straws. Like they were just pulling shit out of their buttholes and trying to make it work because they just, they wanted to get a, a prosecution. They wanted to get a conviction. They didn't care about actually getting justice. They didn't care about finding out who truly killed Betsy. They just wanted a conviction. If you thought that that was crazy, okay, it gets worse, right? So Russ's defense obviously thought that this whole thing was stupid. They thought that the prosecution's argument was stupid because it was. And they also saw all of the inconsistencies in Pam's story. They saw how suspicious it was that she was made the sole beneficiary of a hundred and fifty 
thousand dollar life insurance policy five days before the murder and they obviously wanted to point all of this out but they were not allowed to do so they were prevented from providing any evidence that would indicate that Pam could be a potential suspect in this case. They couldn't show the phone records that proved that Pam was at the Faria household for 30 minutes after she said that she had left. They couldn't cross-examine her about the life insurance policy despite the fact that Pam had given testimony in this trial about the life insurance policy herself. She had taken the stand to say that $100,000 of the policy had been given or put in a trust for Betsy's two daughters. And then she also said that the other $50,000 was going to the 12 year old daughter of another friend who had died of cancer back in August, which why on earth would Betsy's money be going to this 12 year old girl that Betsy doesn't even know. Like that money was for Betsy's daughters. And there was also no effort to verify what she had said. There was no effort to verify that she had put this $100,000 in a trust, which mind you, she hadn't. And the defense couldn't point any of this out. They couldn't cross-examine her about this. They, they couldn't say anything. They could not say anything that would point Pam out as an alternative suspect. So in the end, on the 21st of November in 2013, Russ was convicted on one count of first degree murder and one count of armed criminal action. And then in December, he was sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years without the possibility of parole. And he was sent to the Jefferson City Correctional Center. And despite the fact that the prosecution's case was built around the idea that his four friends that provided his alibi were complicit in the murder and they were like co-conspirators in this murder, murder, none of them ever faced any charges. So did they really even believe their own story about his friends all being in on it? Doesn't seem like it. His four friends actually didn't even know that the prosecution had tried to implicate them as co-conspirators until like they found out through the media. So obviously shortly after sentencing, Russ made an appeal attempt, which was denied in December of 2013. In February of 2014, KTVI partnered with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and they found that Pam Hupp had actually kept the entire $150,000 and she hadn't put any of that money into a trust for Betsy's two daughters like she had claimed. I don't know if they mentioned this in that particular review either, but that 12 year old girl obviously never received that $50,000 that Pam claimed that she gave to her as well. This review also poked a bunch of holes in Pam's stories and pointed out a bunch of inconsistencies in her stories, like all of the ones that I've mentioned before, basically, such as her claiming in her first interview that she never went into the Faria household that night, but then changing her story on that twice and also having phone records show that she was there for 30 minutes. It also came to light that the lead prosecutor on this case was in a sexual relationship with the lead investigator on this case who also happened to be the captain of investigations for the whole of the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department, which is obviously not a good look. And the jurors on the case during Russ's trial said that they weren't informed of this fact. So obviously after this report came out, it really got people thinking and it got people questioning the entire trial and the entire case against Russ. And in 2015, a judge actually granted Russ a retrial and released him on bond while he was awaiting this second trial. The second trial began in November of 2015, Russ had the same defense team and this time they were allowed to present evidence that implicated Pam. The defense also called a CSI expert up to the stand who testified that the bloody slippers, the one piece of evidence that the prosecution had against Russ, were likely not bloodied by stepping through blood, but actually bloodied by being dipped in blood. And if this is the case, then it's likely that these slippers were just planted by the real killer. They also brought up the Microsoft Word document that was found on Betsy's computer that Pam had pointed out to them and just all of the weird things about this, how Betsy didn't actually have Microsoft Word, how it was the only thing on her computer that was written by an unknown author and it just kind of furthered the fact that somebody was trying to plant evidence against Russ. During this retrial, it also came out that basically during the first trial, a detective had said that the camera that was used to photograph the crime scene had broken and so they were unable to 
provide any of the photos from the crime scene in the first trial that were basically crucial to Russ's defense. But then somehow for the retrial, the defense was able to get a hold of these photos of the crime scene. So it just seemed like for that first trial, something really shady was going on and that there was just way more of a focus on getting conviction against Russ rather than providing proper evidence and trying to figure out what actually happened to Betsy and who actually murdered Betsy. During this retrial, Pam also took the stand in an effort to defend herself. And she gets up on the stand and she claims that her and Betsy were actually secret lovers and that Russ found out. And so he killed Betsy in a fit of rage, which like, what is this woman on? Like she is just trying to do everything she can at this point to save her butt and no one in the courtroom is buying it. One of Pam's friends actually took the stand and testified that Pam was one of the most homophobic people that she had ever met in her life. So there's that. The retrial ended up lasting four days and on the 7th of November in 2015, Russ's conviction was overturned after he had already spent four years in prison. The year after this in 2016, he actually sued the Lincoln County Prosecutor's Office for his wrongful conviction and he was awarded $2 million. But holy smokes, I cannot imagine like this poor fella, not only is he dealing with like the murder of his wife and he's probably grieving that, but instead of being able to grieve, for his wife who was brutally murdered. He instead had to go to trial for her murder and was then wrongfully convicted for a murder that he didn't commit that he was trying to grieve. Obviously the prosecuting attorney and the judge on this case were heavily criticized. The judge on the case was eventually suspended by the Supreme Court of Missouri for unrelated misconduct. So I guess she just like sucked in general, not just in this case, but both the prosecuting attorney and the judge were voted out of office in 2018, which is believed to have been a result of the mishandling of Russ's case. So anyway, following Russ's retrial and his conviction being overturned, there was now the question of if Russ didn't do this, who did? And of course, like Pam was the prime suspect, but she was already on the move. She was already planning what to do next and how to get out of this. And she came up with a very dramatic plan. On the 16th of August in 2016, she calls 911 reporting a burglary in progress. And I'll play part of this clip to you now because it was odd to say the least. 911, where's your emergency? Hey, hello, there's someone breaking in my house. Help. What's Help. the address you're at? Help. Want me to give you, you want me to give your wife? No, I'm not getting in the car with you. No, what get away. Your address? Oh, get out, get out, get out. Help. Ma'am, what's the address you're at? Uh, help, help. I have somebody breaking in. No, no, no. Hello? Ma'am, can you hear me? Help! So just after that part of the phone call, there are five gunshots and those gunshots are from Pam shooting the man that is allegedly trying to rob her, who is 33 year old Lewis Gumpenberger. She shot him dead in her home all while on the phone to police. When authorities show up at Pam's house, she tells them that she was just like innocently sitting in her car, which was parked inside her garage. When all of a sudden Lewis comes up, jumps out of his car, runs up to her with a knife and demanded that she drive him to the bank to get Russ's money for him. She then says like something out of a movie that she karate chopped the knife out of his hand and then runs back to her house, but Lewis chases her. And so she shot him five times in self-defense. Police obviously start investigating the whole situation straight away. And right from the get go, it is not looking good for old Pam. They very quickly find out that this is just another scheme that she had come up with to once again, try and blame Russ for his wife, Betsy's murder and deflect blame off of herself. They found that Pam had gone up to Lewis and she had impersonated or pretended that she was a Dateline producer and offered him $1,000 to reenact a 911 call, which Lewis had accepted. They actually found this other woman named Carol who Pam had done the exact same thing to 
to. So we can only assume that what happened to Carol is exactly what happened to Lewis. And so what Carol claims happened is that Pam approached her. She told her that her name was Kathy and that she was a Dateline producer and that she would give her a thousand dollars to reenact a 911 call. Carol accepted and Pam told her that she would need to come with her in her car and that Carol wouldn't be able to bring her cigarettes, her phone, her wallet, her keys. Basically she couldn't bring anything because the producer didn't like clutter. Carol thankfully was skeptical from the get go. And so she did bring her cell phone and she also brought two knives to defend herself with in case it was like some sort of scam, which is exactly what it was. And halfway, you know, while Pam is driving her halfway through, Carol says, look, can you take me home? I forgot to lock my front door. Can you take me back so I can do that? And so Pam takes her back so she can lock her front door. And Carol just basically tells her, look, I don't, I can't do this anymore. I've got to go pick my son up. Pam did try to argue with her a little bit, but Carol told her, I have a knife and I'll call 911. So just basically piss off. And so Pam left and there's CCTV footage from the car park of Carol's trailer park where she lived of Pam's car driving away. And it has Pam's car and her license plate number in this footage, which verifies Carol's entire story. Six days later, Pam approached Lewis with obviously the same story and he accepted. And when his body was found, police found nine $100 notes in his back pocket. And then they found one more $100 note on Pam's dresser. And these like 10 notes all had the same serial numbers. So, you know, the ones in his back pocket were clearly linked to the $100 bill on Pam's dresser. There was also a note found in Lewis's back pocket which read, take Hup back to house, get rid of her, make look like Russ wife, make sure knife is sticking out of her neck. There was also a knife that was found wedged between the passenger seat and the console of Pam's car. And this is the knife that she alleged Lewis wielded against her. But it was actually proven that Pam had purchased both this knife and the note, like the paper that the note in Lewis's back pocket was written on from the Dollar Tree at the same time. Like it was proven that she had made this purchase and she had purchased both of these things. It was also proven that she had placed an extra piece of carpet in the hallway of her apartment to prevent Lewis's blood from damaging her rug. Pam also claimed that she had never met Lewis, but phone records showed that she had been at his house. She had picked him up from his house less than an hour before his murder, and then she drove him to her house where she placed this fake 911 call and shot him five times, killing him. And the worst part of this whole thing is that Lewis actually had diminished mental capacity as well as physical disabilities from a 2005 motorbike accident, which left him partially paralyzed. So he lived with his mom due to these disabilities and he rarely left the house alone. But on this one rare occasion that he did, Pam found him and he wound up dead. She killed a disabled man just to try and frame once again for his wife's murder. Not to mention Lewis was physically incapable of leaping from the car or chasing Pam into her house like she claimed that he had when she spoke to police. So Pam was arrested a week after the fake 911 call on the 23rd of August in 2016. And she was charged with the first degree murder of Lewis Gumpenberger and also armed criminal action. While she was in police custody, she actually took a ballpoint pen from the interrogation room. And when a female officer escorted her to the bathroom, she stabbed herself in the wrist and in the neck in an attempt to end her own life, which can I just point out is how Betsy was killed. She was stabbed in the wrist and in the neck. So Pam's attempt was unsuccessful and her bail for her trial was set at $2 million. In January of 2017, she pled not guilty to the murder and prosecutors announced that they were gonna pursue the death penalty on account of the fact that she chose a random disabled man to effectively use as a puppet in her stage kidnapping and in doing so took his life. This man had nothing to do with anything and she killed him in order to try and deflect blame from another murder that she 
she had committed. And then while awaiting trial for Lewis's murder and with all of this heat on Pam, some more information came to light about her. Her mother, Shirley Newman, died on the 31st of October in 2013 at 77 years of age as a result of falling from the third floor balcony in her senior living center. It was ruled an accident at the time, but people were definitely second guessing that now. Pam was the last person to see her mother alive. She also inherited $500,000 from her mother's death. And an autopsy showed that Shirley had over eight times the regular amount of Zolpidem in her system, which is a sedative. A month after Shirley's murder as well, the Lincoln County Police received a note, an anonymous note, which indicated that Pam might have been involved in her mother's death. But in the end, Shirley's death was ruled an accident until 2016 when Pam was awaiting trial for Lewis's murder and the cause of death was changed from accidental to undetermined. Any evidence about this was barred from being mentioned in Lewis's trial, but you know, obviously a lot of people think that she murdered her mom as well. So Pam's trial for Lewis's murder eventually got set for June of 2019, which is nearly three years after Lewis's murder and almost eight years after Betsy's murder. But the trial never went ahead because Pam ended up entering an alpha plea to avoid the death penalty. And an alpha plea is basically where a defendant enters a guilty plea where they don't admit guilt, but they admit that the prosecution has enough evidence to convict them. So she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and is now serving her sentence at the Chillicothe Correctional Center in Missouri. Something else about this case that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to mention is that at Lewis's trial, Carol was there, the woman that Pam originally approached to try and get to do that fake 911 call. She was at Lewis's trial to testify and Betsy's husband, Russ, was also there. And Carol kind of said to him, you know, I hope you find happiness. And he did, he found happiness with her and they're engaged now. Russ said, quote, out of all of this bad and this bad, bad, evil person, I mean, she's evil incarnate. If it weren't for her, I wouldn't have met this lovely lady here. I think we both make each other pretty happy. In 2019, Lewis's mum filed a lawsuit against Pam and she was awarded $3 million, but I doubt she will actually unfortunately see most of this money because the money is coming out of like Pam's prison account. Pam also filed a motion to vacate her conviction under the guise that she was pressured to take a plea, but this was denied. She and her husband, Mark, also officially divorced in 2022. And in July of 2021, she was officially charged with the murder of Betsy Faria. They actually refiled the murder charges this year at the end of like October to try and seek a venue closer to Lincoln County where Betsy was murdered in order to allow, quote, a more efficient and less burdensome delivery of justice. And that trial is set for summer of 2025. Prosecutors are seeking the death penalty against Pam. So I'll definitely keep you guys updated and let you know how that goes. But that's everything for this case. And I'm really excited to talk to you guys in the comments about this one, because this case is literally insane. I cannot wait to hear what you think, because I can't even believe that it's real. I cannot believe that people like Pam exist. I also can't believe that it's going to take so long for the trial of Betsy Faria's murder. Like they charged her, they filed charges for this in 2021, and it's not going to go to trial until 2025. That's four years. Like I get that she's already prison, life without parole, whatever. But Betsy's family would want justice. And now they just have to like know this is going to happen in 2025 and they just have to wait for it. Like it just seems crazy that it takes that long. It must be so frustrating for our family and our friends. And this whole situation must be so like unimaginably frustrating for Lewis Gumpenberger's mother. Like this guy was completely innocent. He had nothing to do with anything. And Pam murdered him to try and deflect blame off herself for another murder that she had committed. Like it was just completely senseless. And also the fact that his mum said that he rarely leaves the house alone. And on this rare occasion that he did, Pam just happens to target him. It's just so incredibly sad. But that is everything for this case. That's all from me today, guys. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and hopefully I'll see you in my next video. Bye guys.